Jerry. Um, I'm glad to see that you're here. I just got a notification on my phone via Facebook that you've checked in at the next gen event. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Uh, good afternoon. I know it's been a long day, and uh, I just want to begin by, uh, by thanking all of you for coming um, and giving me this opportunity to reflect on the past 10 months. It's just crazy to think that I was sitting right where Aviad was 10 months ago thinking, what the hell did I get myself into? Uh, but here I am a year later, and uh, maybe I, I have some insight about that. But before I get into it, I, I do want to just offer a few thanks. Uh, and the first goes to the Rig Selection Committee, some of whom are, are here in the room. And I, I want to say thank you for believing in me, for seeing an a potential within me, or I don't know what you saw in me, but thank you for seeing it. <laughs> and uh, for saying that we're going to give this guy uh, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to, to see the Jewish world. And uh, I know I return uh, a much richer and deeper person uh, having all these experiences. I also want to say thank you to the JDC staff, and I don't want to name names, so I'm definitely going to forget someone, but uh, that goes from the office here in New York, the next-gen team, uh, management, senior management here and in Israel, and the field staff. Uh, I think I'm preaching to the choir when I say this, but there is no organization in the world, Jewish, non-Jewish, both, uh, that has the staff like JDC does. And uh, to me, to be able to work uh, with this talented group who really gives, gave me an opportunity to, to live the fullest as a human being, I am forever grateful and I really hope. I thank you for that and I hope that uh, we can continue that relationship. Um, to Ralph, I think he's in the camera somewhere. I just want to say a, a quick thank you to Ralph as well. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it was really an, uh, the, the highlight of my summer to spend time with you in Israel um, and to, uh, you know, I was bashful about asking for more time. Um, you always gave me more time. In fact, uh, Ralph said to me uh, one afternoon, I, I don't have time to talk, but why don't you come with me in a cab? I have a long ride. So I just jump in the cab. I don't know where we're going. And we're talking, and it's great. And I sh we show up somewhere, and I don't want to say it's close to the Negev. It's a, just a general. Um, and, and it turns out that this is a uh, Torah scroll dedication in honor of Itzko, the former director of the Sarash camp. And so here I'm thinking to myself, I just jumped in a car to talk to Ralph, and he just transported me back to Budapest. Um, and so Ralph, thank you for all those wonderful conversations. And uh, last but not least, I have to offer a personal thanks to my wife, who's here with me, Nami. Um, this was my year as a Ralph Goldman Fellow, and so when I said to Nami, um, we're going, we're going to receive our UN. She said yes, and that meant she probably didn't know it at the time, but it was putting her life on hold for a year. Um, you know, the rig, uh, next gen staff said, Zeb, you're gonna have to be flexible. And I think if you speak to my wife, she'll give you a new definition of flexible. <laughs> uh, it, it, it includes last minute decisions and living in all sorts of places like a Bulgarian bus for a week. But um, really, um, Honey, you really, you made this year, and I'm, I feel so, uh, so I'm just overwhelmed that we were able to share it together, and I know that you being there and, and being a part of this work means that we're going to stay connected to JDC and these communities for the rest of our lives. So everyone says to me, are you changed? Are you different? And the truth is, no. No, I'm not. And that's not an indictment, I hope, of myself or of the fellowship, because the truth is I came into all of this thinking, I have a year to test some theories, to test out some ideas about Jewish life, about the Jewish people, about what it means to be living in the 21st century uh, and living as a Jew. And um, because I've always believed in this notion of the Jewish people, that there's some sense of uh, uh, inherent connectedness amongst us uh, just because we identify as, as Jewish, uh, I, I sort of went out into the world and wanted to test that. And so I, the big question I asked myself this year is, what does it mean to be part of the Jewish people? And, or I should say, in the macro sense, and, and what does it mean to be part of a Jewish community? Um, and luckily I have, uh, I'm bringing with me three friends uh, to discuss here. The first is gonna be Hungary, the second is gonna be Australia, and the third is gonna be China. And um, I'm actually not gonna focus so much on the first two, it's just to set up sort of a conceptual framework to talk about China, because I think that that's, that was an area of the world that I never thought I'd end up in, certainly this year. Um, and I think that it might be of great interest to you. So I first went to Hungary um, to work on leadership training programs in the Balkan Peninsula through the uh, Gesher Balkans region. Um, and I remember in the first days that I was there, I, I sat down with a, a Jewish professional in the city, and I kept asking him all these questions about the Jewish community. Tell me about the Jewish community. And every time he said to me, society, 
It's not a community. It's a society. And I'm thinking to myself, great. A Romanian-Hungarian who likes semantics. <laughs> but I'm sure some of you have been to Budapest and know exactly what I'm talking about. But the truth is, the more I thought about it, um, the more I realized there is something, hopefully, there is something to this. And, and I started thinking about what does it mean to be part of a community. And I, I really saw what he was getting at, in that community is something that you work toward. It's a vision that you buy into as a group. Society is kind of, it's what you were born into. Like, you know, there is a society, and the, to work towards the next level is what is exactly building community. And, um, you know, there's a lot of stories that I can bring to you from Budapest, but just one sort of data point that sticks in my mind is something that I saw in the JDC supported Ballen House. Uh, Ballen House is, is in the center of downtown Budapest, and um, they offer uh, tons of different kinds of programs, dance, culture, learning, daycare. They make a great Kremish cake. Uh, but essentially, um, you have people who are paying for a la carte programming there. Nobody, very few people are signing up for full memberships to the JCC. And the full membership to the JCC, if you compare it to uh, what it costs to attend each program, is actually cheaper. But people aren't doing it. And uh, a JDC colleague explained to me that it's a holdover from communism. In people's minds, they didn't want to register with an organization that was Jewish. So they'll put themselves out there and go to a Jewish space. They'll go into a Jewish building. But they're not, they're not going all the way there. And um, you know, it, it struck me that while there's a lot of fantastic organizations, um, formal and informal, in Budapest today, uh, the work is to move from this group of amorphous different uh, individuals towards a community. If we jump from there to Australia, it was a completely different uh, picture. Um, I was sent to Australia to be an educator at Limud Oz. Um, Sarah sent me an email sometime in April and said, well, we did the math and you're the closest JDC person to Australia. <laughs> uh, at the time I was in Singapore. And um, they, sent, they said, go to Australia, talk about JDC, talk about service. And I was really excited about this. Uh, this opportunity. And um, I'm sharing with you here, this is the poster that the Limud Oz sent to me. They said, you're going to be in the newspaper. So I'm so excited. So I'm looking at it. And you can see, I really probably can't see, on the fourth one on the left there. Um, and I'm looking at this poster and I see, great. Above me it says, David Katz, uh, Judaic Studies Professor Leading Yiddish Specialist and Holocaust Survivor. Okay, so Yiddishist. Oh, sorry, Holocaust. I say survivor, sorry, scholar. Um, then it says Zeb Nagel, Jewish Globetrotter, fellow with the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. <laughs> and then it says Ephraim Zuroff, Nazi hunter. <laughs> and I'm thinking, great, this is what I'm up against in Australia. But, and I'm joking a little bit, so if there are any Aussies in the room, um, it's, Australia is a fantastic place, and when it comes from looking at the Jewish community, it's so well organized and so well developed. But this frame that I'm pointing to about being in between a Yiddishist and a Nazi hunter uh, speaks a lot to the, the core values in the Australian Jewish community. Um, and if you, if you look through the rest of this, uh, this poster, you'll see a lot, a lot of topics focus on Israel and a lot of topics focus on the Holocaust. Um, and as many of you will know, reading the data on young Jews today, no matter where they live, uh, this is, these, are, these are two pillars which many, many young Jews today don't find themselves standing in between. And within Australia, they are forced to ask themselves today as a community, how do we create a, 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 a community that's inclusive and pluralistic, and that's a big tent for everyone, um, and that we can, you know, e even though we know that young people today might not identify with these two core issues. Um, and so, you know, when you, when you put that out on the context of Hungary, you see a much more developed community, but one that still needs to ask itself the core question as to what does it mean to be part of this community. Which brings us to China. Now, as, um, as JDC's efforts to look at the newly emerging uh, communities in Asia, I was sent to this part of the world to basically conduct a, a study. In technical sense, it's called community mapping. And to learn about the local communities, to see what they're like, who lives there, what kind of Jewish institutions do they house, what kind of needs do they potentially need. And to connect this, link this into the general growth of JDC's leader, global leadership and, and work around the world. Now, um, as some of you might know, there's actually a very limited history of Jews in China. I think, uh, you know, historical documents show that Jews settled down there in the early uh, 7th or 8th century. They were traders who traveled along, along the Silk Route. Um, there's the city of Kaifeng, which you might hear about, which there are apparently some Jews still there today, or uh, people of Jewish ancestry, as they call them. Um, 
But uh, really, Jewish settlement in China gets exciting in the, in the middle of the 19th century when Iraqi Jews from Baghdad start moving out there uh, as the uh, British Empire starts to grow, followed by the 1920s by Russian Jews coming down um, to escape persecution there. And then probably the, moder the, the largest influx, which was in the 1940s, um, the European Jews is trying, uh, fleeing the Nazis. But by the 1960s, right up to the Cultural Revolution, uh, this is all pretty much done in China. The, the, the Jews who were left um, either assimilated or sort of left the Jew, whatever was left of the Jewish structure, and, or, or people ran away. And today, when we talk about Jews in China, we're talking about largely expats. Uh, Americans, Brits, French Jews, Panamanians, Israelis, even Russian Jews. It's a real motley crew. Um, and I think that uh, you know, this history is important because it means that to be a Jew in China today is to be largely anonymous. Meaning that um, you know, there are 56 registered minority groups in China, but Jewish or Judaism is not one of them. Um, and that's because at the time that the Chinese came up with the list, they couldn't count any Jews in China. Uh, but that also means that there's really no history of anti-Semitism. And across China, um, if you can somehow communicate to a Chinese person that you're Jewish, you'll inevitably, be, inevitably get some kind of answer that goes like this. They look at you and they say, oh, Jewish. Very smart. <laughs> very, very smart. <laughs> and it's as, and uh, if you didn't get it already, they'll also go like this. Very, very <laughs> smart. <laughs> Um, and, okay, that's nice. This picture up here is actually a picture of a Chinese bookstore that has um, different, different kinds of books. And some of these books have titles such as Jewish Business Success, Crack the Talmud, 101 Jewish Business Rules, and my personal favorite, Know All of the Money-Making Stories of the Talmud. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm, as I'm hearing this or learning about this, I'm thinking, if I was anywhere else in the world, if I was in Istanbul or Kuala Lumpur, I, my heart would start beating really, really fast, and I, my blood would boil, I would call Abe Foxman. <laughs> just, it would, it would, you know, I would just have a completely different reaction. But, but this is China, and that's not the way they're conveying it to you. Um, and it actually hit me, I spent an afternoon at the uh, Shanghai Jewish Refugees Museum, which is essentially the, a museum in Shanghai that the Chinese uh, have built to honor what, in many respects, they did in saving Jews um, who were fleeing Nazi persecution. And I spent the afternoon with a few docents there, young uh, college-aged Chinese students, and, and it occurred to me that the Chinese have basically gone out there, they've read the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and they say to themselves, oh, an international cabal to control the world. Why didn't we think of that? What a great idea. <laughs> um, and, you know, all cynicism aside, um, this is a certain picture that you get, and my personal views are that there's a lot of good work that can be done to move the Chinese to a, to a more mutual and symbiotic relationship with, with, with Jews and the global Jewish people. But at the same time, this actually might be changing with the rea reality on the ground, because there are um, anywhere between 5,000 to 8,000 Jews in mainland China today, working in all sorts of industries. Um, I would get the, was at a progressive congregation in Beijing where I saw a three-year-old kid who could have been my nephew speaking Mandarin fluently. Uh, so you have this, um, you have this, you, you, you have this something changing on the ground. And what I'd like to share with you is what the, these different Jewish communities in China are asking themselves from really the surface level saying, well, what does it mean for us to be Jewish in China? And what kind of community do we want to build? Um, you know, we are in a place where um, um, everyone around us, even the, foreign, even the expats, they don't have the same sense of personal identity, which is essentially a question that the Hungarians ask themselves, the Hungarian Jews ask themselves. And then they also look and say, well, there's no history of persecution. There's no uh, albatross of history that we, we need to wear, which is, as I framed it, what the Australian community asks us. So, you know, putting those two together, the Chinese Jewish communities are asking, where do we go forward? And so uh, I wanted to show you a couple of, of answers. So this is what the, the Jewish community in Guangzhou, which is uh, also known as Canton, the you know the delicious Cantonese food comes from Canton. They decided, I'll go back for a second, to uh, to build a falafel shop. Now this shop, I wouldn't say it was just the community's decision; it was also an Israeli businessman's decision. Uh, but this shop, as you might be able to see, is not only kosher, it's not only halal, it's also vegetarian, and. Um, 
And uh, it sits in the city of Guangzhou. It's open 24 hours a day, six days a week. They don't roll falafel balls on Shabbos. <laughs> you get that joke. Um, and uh, you can go to the next slide. You can see that this is essentially, this is, a, this is actually an institution in the community. Um, the 750 or so Jews that are living permanently in Guangzhou treat this as a place to go. It's like the night that we went there, there were just tons of people hanging out there. Um, but of course, like the, the, uh, the uh, as I said, the Hungarian and the Australian communities, Jewish life in China is also tied to the past. And uh, an important part of that history is, as I mentioned, the, um, the history of Jews uh, who escaped Nazi persecution in, into Shanghai. Now this is a picture of the JDC office building uh, that stands today in the Hongku ghetto. Uh, JDC worked out of this building uh, during the 40s to process Jews and to, um, and to get them settled in this area. And of course, beyond that, um, you also have this, the history of the Baghdadi Jews, as I mentioned beforehand, who came to China to, 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 for economic reasons and ended up building uh, amazing synagogues. This is one of them called Ohel Rachel which is now used by the Chinese government uh, to, as a storage house for the education ministry, but quite possibly one day, <coughs> excuse me, could go back and be a part of, of Jewish life. Two minutes, okay, finishing up. So, as you can see, like, like so many communities, China itself also needs to ask these basic questions as what does it mean to be Jewish, and what does it mean to be Jewish in China? And although JDC has limited uh, resources in, in what it can uh, functionally do on the ground, in the short time that I was there and that some of my colleagues from the Africa Asia Department have been out there, we've already seen how, just with the conversation, grassroots activists there are, are getting linked into this global picture of Jewish life and saying <clears throat> you know, things like the mood or other ideas that, that they can use, utilize to develop their own communities. <clears throat> I just want to end with just a short story. Um, <clears throat> I was at the Shanghai Jewish Refugees Museum one afternoon, I mentioned beforehand, and I'm standing in the back there, kind of nondescript. One of the buildings is, is actually the sanctuary of an old synagogue built by Russian immigrant, Jewish immigrants to Shanghai. And I'm standing there, and a group comes in from Canada. It was a group of Canadians, and I knew that because one of them told me they were from Newfoundland, and uh, also Israelis who were living in Canada. And they're standing milling around in this sanctuary, um, which, and not really sure what to do because I think they were surprised to find a synagogue on the premises. I'm standing in the back and I'm watching them. They basically organized an impromptu ceremony and they started singing a song, uh, the words of which I think almost all of them did not know. I'm not a cantor, but I think they were making up the tune as well. And, but, but they were having a moment here. And so I, after they were done, I, I quietly went over. Um, I wasn't wearing a kippah, so they didn't know who I was or why I was even there. And I, and I asked why they did it, and they explained to me, oh, we're Jewish, and this is a Jewish space, and uh, we wanted just to let, let this place know that Jews have returned and are here in, in Shanghai. And I, and I said to them, did you know that there's 20 minutes away, there's, there's a Jewish kindergarten, there's a Chabad house, there's even a kosher restaurant. And they were stunned. And they were so stunned that they decided to skip the uh, mugu gai pan that they were about to eat at this <laughs> Chinese banquet and go to the kosher restaurant and eat schnitzel. And these were people, they told me they don't eat kosher, but they felt the need that they were here in Shanghai and found out that there were Jews down the road and that there was kosher schnitzel, and they were going. And this, this experience, as anecdotal as it is, uh, it, just, it, you know, it just hit home for me. And, and this, as I said, essentially realizes when you travel the world as a, as, as, a, as a Jewish person and look for those connections, uh, you think about what are, what are the currency that we share in conversation? What do we, what do we put out on the table to say that we, you know, we are uh, of similar mindset and of, a, of, a, of the same people? And, um, and, you know, and, and there it is in Shanghai, uh, an impromptu you know, ceremony involving schnitzel and, and song to say that we're part of, a, of an interconnected and intertwined Jewish world. Um, the most, uh, what, oh, I think one of the most exciting things about this project in China is that it's, it's actually not over. Certainly not, uh, well, possibly, it's over for me. But it's not over for JDC. And um, I'm really excited to wake us in right now to, uh, with uh, Janine Buzali, who is going to be, the, who will be the first Jewish Service Corps Fellow in Shanghai, who will be working at the Shanghai Jewish Refugees Museum. Um, and she'll be using the research, the learning that I've done, that I've shared with the organization going forward um, to uh, enhance Jewish life in Shanghai. So, Janine.